Good morning and welcome everyone to the uh, Istituto Affari Internazionali for our uh, meeting today with uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. It's a real pleasure, it's a real honor, Svetlana, to have you with us here in the Institute today. Um, given that uh, indeed we're going through uh, a pretty uh, tumultuous period uh, in, uh, in, in, in the situation in, in Belarus and, and I would say more broadly in the region. Perhaps a couple of words to sort of uh, set, set the context uh, to all of this. Sort of once upon a time, uh, democracy and democracy promotion was uh, an important tenant in the foreign policies of uh, European countries, of the European Union, uh, of the United States. Uh, if we just think about uh, how much democracy featured, for instance, in our enlargement policies and our neighborhood policies and our trade policies and our development policies, if we go through the 1990s, the 2000s, uh, it was really a linchpin of, if you like, Western foreign policy. <laughs> We went then through a period which almost lasted, I would say, a decade, uh, in which we kind of forgot about uh, democracy and democracy pro uh, promotion. So geopolitics was back, uh, authoritarianism was on the rise, uh, de-democratization, if you like, was, uh, was, was increasingly prominent, uh, and Western powers themselves uh, increasingly sort of started forgetting about uh, how important democracy was uh, in the construction, if you like, of their foreign policies. Now, that period uh, seems to have, in many respects, fortunately, I would say, uh, gone, or it is certainly going. Uh, we see now how in uh, US foreign policy under President Joe Biden, uh, rights and democracy again feature very prominently in the discourse and the practice of the foreign policy. And we begin to see how democracy uh, again is uh, <coughs> beginning to feature more prominently in the discourse uh, of European countries as well. Now, all of this uh, has been taking place at a time in which, um, as I was saying at the outset, some pretty dramatic events have been taking place in Belarus. Uh, if we go back uh, to last summer, uh, we, uh, as we were observing uh, elections uh, in the country, uh, we were all, uh, on the one hand, uh, taken by uh, surprise and then by dismay uh, at what happened. Uh, surprise and, uh, and really sort of enthusiasm to see how in uh, Europe's, alas, not only, but certainly oldest uh, dictatorship, uh, an opposition movement uh, led by Svetlana uh, really uh, sort of uh, managed to achieve significant results. And in fact, those results would have probably been even more significant uh, had those elections been uh, uh, aptly monitored. Uh, what has been obviously happening since then in the country has been both, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it has been both in a sense terribly depressing, uh, as well as obviously uh, incredibly, incredibly inspiring. So to think about uh, the mobilization that has been going on uh, since last summer up until uh, today, despite the ongoing and increasing crackdown uh, on the opposition uh, is, really tells us a story about, on the one hand, uh, democratic resilience uh, of the population, as well as obviously uh, how difficult it is uh, once authoritarianism is entrenched uh, to really turn the page. So in, in turning now to, to Svetlana, I would really like to ask you, you know, in this context, uh, Svetlana, how do you see, in a sense, the fate uh, of the opposition movement that you have been leading in a context in which, what, 30,000 people uh, have been put in jail? And obviously, this has been having a pretty important impact on the potential uh, for mobilization. You yourself, uh, you can uh, no longer obviously go back to your own country. Uh, how, how does one uh, sort of let the opposition leave on and continue mobilizing in a situation in which uh, its leadership is uh, is 
away from the country. And then perhaps if I could ask you, given what I was saying at the outset, you know, democracy being back, at least in, in words, huh, in the foreign policies of, of Western countries, what is it that you th think that uh, Europe, that the United States uh, should do in this situation? Thank you. Uh, yes, you have correctly said that uh, since August, 35,000 uh, people have been detained and people really live now in constant feeling of fear. People are scared by the, uh, re this repressive machine and people are tortured and humiliated physically and mentally in uh, our prisons and we know these evidences and everything is scary. But despite of this, people are continuing to fight because the elections were fraudulent. Our people are standing against violence, against tortures, against fraudulent election in uh, our country. They want to change our future through new elections. They want to return their right to choose uh, their president. Uh, they want to live further. And this, uh, despite this violence, they are continuing to fight and they you no, know, the uh, outstanding feature of uh, our revolution or evolution, as we call uh, it in, in Belarus, is that uh, our movement is decentralized. Uh, if this regime uh, snatch one person, one of the like uh, leader of the uh, opposition, people will continue to resist. People will uh, self-organize and they are uh, building the structures by themselves. You know. And we don't have this dictatorship manner in this revolution as Lukashenko always used. Uh, I'm not going to tell people you have to go there, you have to, uh, you know, to, to demonstrate here. People themselves decide what to do. We are coordinating. We are in touch all the time. Thanks to internet, we are in constant dialogue with different groups uh, of people, with medics, with students, with workers. You know, we are communicating to hear each other, to listen to each other, to feel each other. But how to act? It's up to people. You know, that's why uh, we like mobilizing each other. So that's why our movement is resistible. Our movement is uh, moving further. And despite, uh, you, know, you know, even I, I already told, even if they uh, jail some political <coughs> leaders, uh, this movement will continue. I think this is our uh, outstanding feature. And uh, the second question about uh, the USA, uh, you know, uh, Valery Kowalewski, my representative on foreign affairs, he lived in the USA a long time, but he left wonderful country just to join us because his heart uh, feels pain. He's Belarusian, but he lived a long time in the USA. So I will give, uh, I will give the word to him. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I will probably start with uh, on answering to this question about e what EU and US can do uh, at the moment. I think I would start with the probably final thought I always give uh, on this question uh, is the most important is consistency. Uh, if you adopt a policy, stick to this. Uh, we've seen it before, uh, especially uh, in with regard to the Belarusian situation uh, is that sometimes really well drafted policy design policies that would be introduced swiftly uh, they they would be corroded over time and quite uh, quite promptly and uh, uh, Lukashenko's regime knows how to do this they they know how to create cracks they know how to kind of deconsolidate the position of uh, the international community we've seen it in 2010 uh, after the crackdown of those elections uh, sanctions were introduced quite swiftly, uh, but uh, in, in just a bit of time, uh, when uh, Lukashenko released political prisoners, uh, they were lifted as sort of as a sign of uh, recognition of the progress uh, in improving the situation in Belarus. Um, uh, therefore, solidarity is very important uh, in, uh, um, uh, in terms of supporting uh, civil society, but also those people who've been repressed, those people who went under the pressure but those people who continue uh, fighting for, uh, for the freedoms um, on a daily basis. Um, finally, we can go to practical issues, practical steps uh, on putting pressure on the regime. Um, at this point of time, our main objective is to force the regime to start negotiating with the society. 
these negotiations would have to lead us to a free and fair elections. Uh, but in order for the regime to, uh, to recognize uh, the, the crisis and recognize that there is no way out, that uh, it will not survive but just waiting out, just, just sort of uh, the time it's on its side, this is what they think, but this is not the case. Uh, the, the pressure, international pressure, needs to be uh, built up uh, on a gradual basis, uh, hopefully in a coordinated manner, synchronized manner by the European Union, United States, also United Kingdom and Canada. Uh, this, uh, these measures should cut off all financial flows to the regime. Uh, sanctions that should be introduced to, uh, to kind of to send a signal to the elites uh, uh, around Lukashenko that uh, kind of their support of Lukashenko will not uh, will hurt their interest uh, in the long run. And also, we are advocating for targeted economic sanctions uh, for those enterprises that uh, kind of become the, the main sources of uh, currency for, for the regime, for the economy, but also those enterprises that violate human, human rights, workers' rights on a daily basis. So in combination, all these efforts should, uh, should bring us to, uh, to that point when the regime recognizes that uh, kind of there is no oxygen left and there's need to, to sit down at the table and start discussing the way out. Well, thank you for that. And, and I think you really... Uh emphasized an, an important point here. Uh, I mean, you, you talked about consistency and, and you talked about, in a sense, strategic patience. Uh, now, the problem, I think, in many respects is one of, let me say, who blinks first? Because we know that, unfortunately, the Lukashenko regime has a lot of patience. <laughs> uh, and so the question is, indeed, uh, the West needs to have likewise. But of course, then, Svetlana, you have people, you know, you have the opposition. And of course, patience for the opposition in a situation in which uh, they are being uh, imprisoned, in which uh, there is torture going on, it is a high ask to, to expect, you know. Um, and and you, you point to, I think, an, an extremely important aspect of what constitutes the resilience, if you like, of, 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 of the opposition movement and the fact that it is inherently democratic and therefore it does not rely on one single uh, leader. Uh, and I think in a sense, this is indeed part of that patience. Uh, but of course, it's, uh, it's much harder to ask in a sense of, uh, of the Belarusian people <laughs> to be patient given what, uh, uh, what is going on. Uh, and also given that Indeed, there is inevitably uh, um, the expectation uh, that there, there is, you know, a form of leadership to, uh, to look up to, which, of course, I think is the reason why uh, your, your own personal role is, uh, is perhaps not, uh, if you like, um, as you say, it is the, not the only thing that explains what's been going on, but uh, I think it's important to highlight that it's an important piece of the explanation as to why it's been uh, uh, so resilient up until now. Um, let, me, let me perhaps uh, see if uh, uh, some of the people in our room, before I start asking, in fact, people in the chat function, if you can start also asking your own questions that I can post as Vitlana, but in the meantime, let me perhaps ask Nana to uh, pose her own question. Uh, thank you for your international speech. Uh, I would like to speak about the elephant in the room, which is Russia, uh, because Russia decided to help uh, Lukashenko. And I know that uh, there was, were some hopes of also inside opposition that President Putin would reconsider his position towards uh, Belarusian uh, country and people and withdraw his support uh, to Lukashenko, it didn't happen. Uh, I was wondering whether there uh, have been um, some initiatives uh, to approach Russian authorities, I mean, from the opposition groups, if there have been some maybe informal meetings uh, with Russian representatives in order also to explain them what you already pledged, know that what is happening to, happening in Belarus, it's about democracy, it's about human rights, universal values that not, has nothing to do with, with geopolitics. You're absolutely right. Uh, the question in Belarus is not about east or west, south or north, it's about uh, uh, our rights 
our freedom and our independence. And we always clear this, and we always send this clear message to Russia and to everybody that please don't interfere. But I have to underline that in, in the, the standing for human rights, for uh, freedom, uh, it's not interference into political uh, internal affairs. And uh, the same way we are sending clear message to Russia that we, we are neighbors, we always be neighbors. And uh, it's not necessary to afraid the change of president in our country, the change of society in our country. We want to continue our collaboration with you, maybe even make it uh, better, more transparent, open for everybody in Belarus and descent what's going on, because uh, it's a pity, but all the policy between two our countries were like always behind the curtains. People hardly ever known uh, what um, documents are undersigned, what deals uh, are uh, going on, you know, between our countries. We, uh, it's a pity we haven't heard any answers from uh, Kremlin, but we are not giving up. We can't, and we are still continuing to, uh, you know, to look for these contacts on expert level and political level, uh, because, uh, you know, regime, the representatives of the regime are a problem for Kremlin now. And for sure, they would like to solve this problem, but they uh, also don't know how. They can't afford this uh, uh, to happen uh, through revolution, you know, because this situation is not very stable in Russia as well. And that's why we, we, we have to talk, we have to discuss. We, uh, you know, uh, in 21st century, there is possibility to sit and, and discuss everything. And um, that's what we want to. And, uh, you know, regime is becoming uh, politically and economically toxic and it's isolated. And uh, it's better for Belarusian, for Belarus to uh, solve this problem as soon as possible. And it's also profitable for Russia as well. And uh, that's why we, like, on these negotiations we are trying to organize, we see representatives of Kremlin as well for, to, for them to understand what's going on, that nothing is discussed, you know, behind their backs. And uh, if Rana can add anything else to this question, please. I, I, I wanted to, to, to the same questions uh, about the union state. If this Russia proposed union state is still actual in talks between Lukashenko and Putin, and if the opposition leaders have some positions regarding the union state. Uh, we have already this union states for a long time, and we are ready to continue this relationship. We are against full integration because we are independent country. We want to keep our serenity. We are not Russians. We are very close to them. We are friends to them, but we are nationality with, we uh, have our own identity, our own culture and our own language. And we want to keep this independence. If uh, no, we we want to be in this union. Wonderful. We have good trade relationships. Maybe we we will improve them even. Uh, so everything is discussable. Yes, I mean, I I, I think um, in a sense you sort of point to a very in a sense wise approach. Huh? I mean, as you said, and and you've said it since the beginning. You know. This is not about this is not about geopolitics, huh? uh, and in fact, everything has to be done in order to de-geopoliticize a uh, situation which is ultimately about domestic politics and about democracy. Very difficult to do so when you know the minute in which one actor geopoliticizes the situation, and of course, Russia has done this. How to 
step back from this. Uh, and, and I think it's extremely interesting the way in which you highlight how um, you, you do try and do that outreach uh, uh, to, uh, to, to Moscow, precisely because indeed, uh, and I think we're all aware of the fact that it is difficult to imagine that a solution will come um, with the opposition uh, of, uh, of Moscow. So it's, it's uh, interesting, if you like, the, in a sense, a very realistic approach uh, that, uh, that you have to this, while at the same time remaining very much anchored uh, to what your principles are. Uh, Nicoletta wanted to uh, ask a question. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for these um, preliminary remarks. And um, I wanted to say that uh, your action has been incredibly inspirational for many people in Europe, because your fight for uh, democracy and liberty is a constant reminder for us, for our own fundamental values that sometimes we tend to disregard or overlook. Uh, I wanted to ask you if Europe played any role in your fight, I mean, not a the political level, but more at the symbolic and uh, normative level. Is this a reference for uh, your battle? Um, yeah, thank you so much. You know, right uh, after the fraudulent elections, a lot of countries uh, declared that they don't accept uh, the elections, that Lukashenko is illegitimate, and it was really great support to people on the ground. We understood that we, this is our responsibility, of course, but we have allies uh, in the world that the values uh, of democracy is not just words for uh, democratic countries, they are ready to uh, stand for these values. And um, since then, uh, this track. Uh, is uh, you know Belarus was always on the agenda after elections, and we really appreciate. We are grateful for the um, strong position of the majority of the countries, and uh, this is uh, about political level. As for people, uh, the whole world was inspired by uh, our revolution, by, by our peaceful demonstrations, by, by our women, by our, uh, you know, all the people, uh, pensioners, people with special needs that came out to show Basta to this regime. And, uh, you know, it's very prominent that our um, situation uh, united not only people on the ground, but Belarusians all over the world. Because I have to admit that in previous years, there, you know, a lot of Belarusians in, live in different countries, but they were like one, you know, they were separate. They wasn't united. But this year there is a saying uh, among Belarusians, uh, we haven't known each other before this summer. Uh, Belarusian diaspora started to uh, organize and we got tremendous help. We got and we are uh, continuing to get tremendous help from Belarusian diasporas in the USA, in Italy diaspora, in every country. And they now are playing a great role, continuing to play. They are uh, writing letters to political prisoners abroad. And it's such a insp inspiration for those who are in jails now to understand that not only Belarusians, because they don't have get any news from, from uh, freedom. Mm, uh, and this is symbolic gesture of writing letters. It's very, means a lot for those who are in jails. And um, uh, those and diasporas raise a lot of uh, uh, questions in parliam parliaments, in governments of the countries they live in. in. For example, in the USA, it was those and diaspora that uh, moved the um, issue of uh, the Russian Democracy Act and resolution, and it was adopted rather uh, fast, only thanks to, not only, but uh, thanks to the Russian diaspora as well. And uh, just usual people in every country also, they raise awareness uh, about, Belarus, uh, about Belarus. So again, so many women around the world has, were inspired by Belarusian women. And uh, many leaders are, are talking about, um, uh, you know, Belarusian people, they make statements. And all these symbolic uh, gestures, uh, they are uh, very important for, you know, for our fight. And we're really grateful to uh, democratic countries that they like, 
acted, reacted uh, in this way. Well, thank you for that. Um, I have a question here from uh, Susanna Zelenova, uh, and in fact, I invite others to um, uh, to also uh, feed in their their questions uh, on uh, on the Q and A function. Uh, and and Susanna asks, um, so change won't happen outside Belarus. Uh, so what can be done inside Belarus? Uh, how to stay engaged uh, with uh, the people inside the country uh, and, and how to make this change happen. For sure, I have to repeat that what's going on in Belarus, it's responsibility, first of all, of Belarusian people. And people, uh, we saw these demonstrations, we saw the quantity of people that want changes. And uh, in the result of a uh, huge violence and tortures, you know, uh, this regime with the help of violence and guns, it like, su succeeded to suppress demonstrations and rallies, but they didn't manage to suppress uh, protesting, protests inside uh, people, and they will not be able to, even despite of, uh, you know, of these humiliations in jails. And we always get evidences how they treat people who are in jail. And of course, it, it is scary. And uh, but this didn't uh, decrease people's desire to fight. So people are becoming more creative, more inventive. They are looking for new ways how to fight this regime, how to show uh, the presence of, uh, protesting, of protesting movement in Belarus. They are people organizing different initiatives. They may be are not so visible, but the processes are going on. Uh, people are organized, like workers are organized in striking committees. Of course, they are pressed. They are uh, prosecuted by the regime all the time, but new and new members are uh, joining uh, these uh, striking committees. Then doctors are also organized their own um, initiative. They are addressing different international organizations, medical organizations for them to uh, pay more attention to uh, conditions of uh, or conditions of um, stay in uh, political prisoners in in jails. They raise attention to uh, COVID problems in our country. That the numbers, real numbers, are not a much uh, lower uh, or a much higher than uh, uh, it is um, announced. You know, uh, Red Cross also has uh, a lot of. Uh, the members of Red Cross organizations also under, um, how to say, uh, under, under attention. attention, you know, of uh, medics, teachers organized, students, uh, a lot of students uh, ha had to flee the country because of persecution. And now they are looking for uh, ways how to continue the uh, education in, in uh, other universities. And it's also combined them. They are making different flash mobs uh, in their universities on the, in the internet. You know, internet became a platform for fight at, at, at this period of time, because I have to say that this fire uh, or protest and fire hasn't disappeared and people uh, want to go out for demonstrations, but now they are uh, like they are structurized themselves to in future to become more powerful movement because what was going on in, in September and August, it was a little bit chaotic. It was on the desire of people. Now it will be structurized desire. So, you know. And, uh, and perhaps a follow a follow on question to that, which really relates to what your own strategy uh, is. I mean, is is the idea that of essentially sort of quote unquote establishing a sort of shadow government uh, outside the country, and 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 what is the relation? If so, what's the relation between that and all of the sort of bottom up? initiatives that, that you were just referring to now? Our opposition movement, though I have to underline, I don't like this word opposition because at the moment, uh, the majority of girls and people uh, know our opposition. And we are in constant dialogue with all the initiatives, with all the uh, 
organizations with new political parties and old political parties. And there is no competition between anybody in our country now. We have our goal, new elections, and everybody is moving toward this goal. Maybe in different, uh, they, uh, they have different tools or instruments to do this, but they will compete one day for sure, political parties and organizations, but when uh, we will achieve our goal. Nobody is quarreling now. There is absolute consensus uh, in, in uh, all the parties that we have to uh, make a uh, regime step away and then we'll, we, we will build new Belarus just with this competition. And uh, would you please continue? Yeah, I might add on the international uh, side of this, uh, because what we have the luxury of uh, in Vilnius is that we can uh, kind of proceed with this active international engagement. Uh, international support is very uh, is very important, uh, both in terms of pressure on the regime, uh, kind of to recognize the the obvious. There's a crisis there, and there's a need for uh, for uh, kind of to resolve it somehow. Uh, but also through um, uh, through continuous dialogue with national governments, with international organizations in Europe, in the United States, uh, we are developing the measures to stop uh, the violence in Belarus, to release political prisoners, uh, to restore uh, the law in um, uh, in Belarus. Uh, and uh, this is something that we wouldn't be able to do uh, if we if we were in uh, in Minsk, because uh, all political activities right now are essentially restricted to to bear a minimum. And uh, in this context, uh, one of the initiatives that we are developing at the moment uh, is to have an international conference uh, of high level uh, to discuss the crisis in Belarus. Nine months uh, into the crisis, there hasn't been a serious conversation uh, by major stakeholders uh, in the world uh, uh, about the crisis, about its origins, and about the way out uh, of this. And uh, uh, this could also become um, a platform for the dialogue uh, with the authorities. Uh, we, we already talked about the unwillingness uh, kind of to engage uh, with democratic forces. They are playing cool, sort of like we're in control. There is no crisis there. Uh, but this kind of recognition by major stakeholders uh, of the world and uh, um, engagement of, uh, uh, of the authorities in Belarus, but also Russia as a major stakeholder, uh, would pave the way, uh, the way to um, to a serious conversation about uh, the way out. Uh, so, um, this additional function, uh, external affairs uh, of, um, of Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya's office, uh, is very important, kind of in making sure that our approach is systemic uh, and is comprehensive and it's effective on many levels. Absolutely. Um, let me now turn to a question uh, from Lorenzo Stefani, uh, who asks, uh, what is, well, he uses the word opposition, let's not use the word opposition, <laughs> what's uh, um, uh, the relationship, your relationship, or not your relationship, but of the, pe the people's relationship with the Ukrainian people uh, and government, another country recently threatened by Russia's government uh, and its presence and influence? So as for nations, as for people, we uh, always had wonderful relationships with the Ukrainian. You know that Ukrainian language is similar to Belarusian language. And of course, we want to continue uh, continue this, this track. And uh, the Ukrainian people are supporting Belarusians. There are many Ukrainian people that came to embassy uh, in uh, after elections and uh, we are like uh, supporting with uh, transparency, with uh, vocally, uh, uh, they stand against regime and uh, all that stuff. And uh, we now on the, our way to communicating on political level, maybe, uh, you know, the situation in the Ukraine is rather difficult now. And we are like, trying to communicate but of course uh, we have to be cautious a little bit and um, but for sure we uh, uh, one day we will organize a meeting at the highest level and uh, we are in touch with the uh, members of parliament uh, with the uh, diplomats uh, on the in the ukraine and uh, but for sure we 
you know, we don't want uh, to interfere in, into any uh, like uh, internal affairs of the Ukraine at, at that moment. Let me turn, there's now a question from uh, Jose Espin. Um, it's a, rather than a critical question, I would say it's a difficult question. Uh, and it basically uh, says, well, you know, despite all of the uh, organizational work that has been uh, done, the momentum uh, in the demonstrations has been going down. And, uh, and the reasons obviously are related to, to the crackdown, uh, but, I guess the question is, um, you know, do you feel that this uh, claim of the momentum diminishing, is it a founded, is it an unfounded uh, remark? And to the extent that there is something to it, what, this I guess I add to this, uh, what can be done to reverse it? Of course, I have to repeat that uh, the mass demonstrations are not uh, possible now because of a huge level of repressions. And it's a pity that some people think uh, only with images. Uh, so that's why I always, on my meetings with, uh, you know, with the democratic countries, urge, please don't build your policy, your picture-based policy, build uh, values-based policy. Look deeper. I understand that attention because of the lack of these beautiful pictures. I also don't like this world because we don't have to show these pictures to prove that we are fighting, you know, and it's a pity that you picture disappeared, no attention. It's not the right policy. You know, uh, Safeness of people for us is the most value now because we have enough sufferings, we have enough victims, and we want to avoid uh, for the victims. So, of course, people want to go out for huge demonstrations. They are ready. They are ready to go for rallies and just we have to be prepared and the whole world have to be prepared that thousands, thousands will be detained and tortured in jails. Is it what the world want? For sure not. That's why we are trying to solve this crisis without new victims. And uh, people, uh, again, I have to repeat, people want to get out to show that we are here, we are uh, fighting, but we have to watch things twice because, you know, people are, I want to underline people are suffering. You just don't feel this. You don't under, you can't even imagine what's going on with people on the ground. We know there. We want uh, we constantly raise awareness about uh, the situation in our jails. And we don't want more people, more mothers, women, journalists to uh, to, to be in, in, in those positions without water, without food, without pillows. Uh, you know, you know, humiliated uh, morally and and physically. Just for you know, I understand the question, but uh, you just feel uh, our pain. We don't want victims. Let me say, I, I just found this answer an incredibly powerful answer. I mean, at the end of the day, what you're saying as an opposition leader uh, is. Um, we actually don't, almost don't want you to go out because um, this is about people's lives and uh, and an opposite, you know, opposition to a regime can be conducted in different forms. And the first preoccupation has to be uh, the human rights of, uh, of individuals, which obviously begin with the right to life. So let me say, I just, I just found that answer incredibly powerful, incredibly uh, compelling. Uh, let me now turn to a question by Alessandro Gatta. Uh, who asks about um, both in the past, but then obviously hopefully in, in the future, uh, election monitoring. I mean, the fact that obviously international monitors were not, uh, were not allowed and, and what can be done to, to ensure that uh, this will not repeat itself in future. Uh, if you don't mind, I will, I will answer this. 
uh, definitely that we are aiming for the elections that would be monitored uh, and possibly even guided by the international community, by the OCOD, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. Uh, we would appreciate this guidance, we would appreciate this support. Um, uh, at the same time, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya herself appointed a special representative on uh, elections uh, who's been uh, developing the legal base, uh, kind of the, the guidance, the regulations, uh, how to uh, organize uh, the entire process within the existing electoral code, because it is it would be probably impossible for us to uh, reform the legislation at once, but we could um, issue those uh, regulations that would help um, form the commissions, uh, electoral commissions, um, uh, how to uh, allow the observers to uh, to um, to act, to work at the at the precincts, and how to count the ballots. Uh, so all the stages of it. Uh, we would definitely welcome the uh, the participation of international community in this effort, technical expertise, uh, political support, uh, and we are driving for the result that would be credible, that would be recognized by the international community, but most importantly, that would be recognized by Belarusians themselves. And I know we're running out of time. Let me try and, and squeeze uh, one question, perhaps, to, uh, to each. Um, so there's there's one question that really concerns civil disobedience and um, uh, against the regime, obviously, and uh, and how and why has, um, you know, what can be done to really expand civil disobedience in the country to constitute an important feature of the way in which opposition is uh, is expressed towards uh, towards the regime. Uh, and then uh, a final question. Um, which is going back to this idea of an international conference uh, and, uh, and whether you have any evidence uh, that, that would suggest that Russia would actually be willing to participate uh, in such an international conference. Uh, so about international conference, uh, yes, we are interested in having Russia. Uh... And that's who also might, just uh, um, who might host it. Okay, uh, so uh, we definitely are interested in, in seeing Russia at the table. It is a major stakeholder. Uh, they, they should be part of the conversation and uh, we communicated repeatedly to Russia that um, we recognize that there, there are interests of Russia in, in Belarus and we're willing to recognize them and respect them and uh, kind of provide for them as much as possible, as long as they do not contradict uh, national interests, uh, sovereignty. Mm -hmm and independence uh, uh, in the first place. Uh, so uh, Russia at the moment uh, is um, kind of chooses to be part of the problem, uh, but they can be part of the solution if they are taking this responsible step. Because uh, we believe that if, uh, if this resolution to the crisis happens, uh, they will have a stable Belarus uh, right next to, to Moscow. Uh, we, we will maintain uh, the clause in the constitution uh, that says that Belarus uh, is pursuing neutrality. We are not willing to change any geopolitical kind of uh, focuses. Uh, Russia will have a country that will have a responsible, accountable, competent government, uh, which would help improve the relations between the countries. And uh, finally, uh, this new government will be legitimate the government that would be able to sign uh, the documents, to sign uh, the agreements, uh, to talk to talk real business. Because at the moment, Lukashenko does not have the authority to sign any integration papers, to sell any enterprises. Anything that he signs uh, uh, without the authorization from people might be revised and revoked. Uh, so we're sending these signals to Russia. So uh, if Russia is willing to continue going that way, uh, kind of not recognizing the uh, the crisis in Belarus, not finding a solution to it. They are just facing the prospect of um, kind of having a futile foreign policy uh, with Belarus that will not be recognized by anybody, EU, US, uh, you name it. Uh, so this is probably the way to uh, attract uh, Russia to the table, uh, kind of both uh, having negative and positive motivation for them. And a couple of words about people's disobedience. You know, people, uh, I have to repeat, uh, you know, they invent themselves how to disobe disobedient to this regime. They are, they don't buy uh, products of uh, some uh, um, organizations. They don't, uh, they uh, 
withdraw cash uh, from their uh, cards. They don't use uh, um, the service of uh, state banks. They uh, don't want to uh, uh, to buy fuel on separate uh, uh, state petrol stations. So they always uh, look for opportunities for these people disobedient. You don't have, as we as uh, you know, Office of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, we don't, are not inventing anything. People themselves invent and we are supporting the initiatives that how it works now and people themselves through, um, uh, through mass media, through, um, uh, I don't know, Instagram, Telegram, they are attracting more and more people uh, to be involved in, in, in these initiatives. Uh, and just to add two small points, uh, do not buy alcohol and tobacco because they're heavily excised by the state. So they receive huge, huge um, inflows uh, into the budget, uh, which is used kind of to, uh, to pay to police uh, to, to break our backs. Well, I know that you uh, are off to your next engagement. Uh, let me just say, well, a very, very big thank you to, to both of you, in particular, obviously, to, to you, Svetlana. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned uh, how, you know, often when uh, we kind of lose sight of the images uh, uh, of the wonderful, but indeed sensational images, we tend to forget a story. And I think this is indeed one of the tragedies of the age that, that we live in. Uh, but I really do think that your words uh, here today uh, allowed us to, to, in a sense, touch a little bit uh, and get a, get, a, get a more vivid sense of uh, the, the struggle that you're engaged in uh, and the re really the sort of the, the enthusiasm, the passion um, that you put in it. Uh, I think it sort of came out very, very strongly uh, in your words. It certainly touched me personally very much, and I'm sure uh, it did so to all those that have been uh, following us. So thank you for being with us at the Instituto Internazionale and the best of luck.